Recording on the computer. Wow, I've got a whole bunch of tutorials here. Let me just continue with this. I'm trying to get these things sorted. You should be able to see my screen now. Is that I right? can see your screen and well, I'm going to mute everybody so you know the drill now. So there we go. Know the drill. Here we go. John, you're muted. Okay, am I on? Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Good. Ready to go. Let's go. Right. Um, today I'm going to talk about light. Uh, but, and this is a talk which was, um, uh, th this uh, slide was first given a talk Martin gave to the Technical University in Eindhoven in 2008. And but before I start, I want to propose a toast to Martin van der Mark, who, uh, for whom, who wrote most of the slides in this talk in the first instance, and who would have been uh, 60 years old tomorrow, it would have been his 60th birthday tomorrow. So I'd like to propose a toast to Martin. And uh, this is a special bottle of whiskey, which only comes out about once every five years. And I'm just going to take a wee dram in memory of Martin van der Mark, to whom this talk is dedicated, Martin. Martin. Well, okay, so the title of the talk is Light is Heavy. And um, both light and heavy have multiple meanings. And uh, in, in this talk, quite a few of the meanings of both light and heavy will be explored. Um, it's often thought that light is not heavy, that light is light, that light is massless, in fact, that it has no mass at all. And, and this is a meme which comes up, which is something which is like, like a nugget of information that people think they know, that light is, is massless. Light is not massless. Real light is not massless in the sense that it has no mass. It's massless in the sense that it has no rest mass. And there's a difference between rest mass and mass, which I'm going to explore partly, and is one of the things I'm going to explore in this talk. So I'm going to talk about light. I'm going to talk about both weighing light, the weight of light, I'm going to talk about the principle of equivalence as well, the equivalence between inertial and gravitational mass in, in this context. John. And, yep. Um, we can't yep. see anything. Are we not meant to see anything? Oh, you are meant to see something. I, 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 but I thought, I thought it was, maybe you were presenting a black screen for a reason, but um, I'm beginning to wonder. Oh, no. no, no, you are. Just a minute. Bring shared window to the front. How do I do that? Just a minute. I don't have a mouse, apparently. Just a minute, let me just come back up to this. Now we can see something. Okay, that's interesting because there we are. You can see you can see light is heavy now. Yes, yes. Okay, if I go to play. And now it's black. It sharing, of course, bring your shared window to the front. How do I bring my shared window to the front? Okay. Right, let's try double clicking on it. Can you see anything now? Nope. Okay, let me, let, let me try something completely different then. I'll just go to, uh, right, you might be able to see me now, just a moment. Let me find the um, keynote presentation. And can you now, can you now see, yeah, we can see, see the what principle? Doing now. Yeah. Right, okay, now let's try play from here. Can you see it now? Yeah, that's it. I, I thought right. the black slide was great, actually. I've never seen yeah. that before. Well, no, it's just there are too many options here. There was a, uh, it said share this thing, but when we went on to play, it went on to whatever was sitting behind it. So anyway, no, we've got it now. That's fine. So, so, so this is the title page of the presentation. Uh, light is heavy. And um, it says sharing is paused again. Can you see it now? Yes. Okay, good, good, good. Right, okay. So we're going to talk about, I'm going to talk about the weight of light, how you weigh light. Um, how, how one could weigh light in the context of the principle of equivalence between the inertial and gravitational mass. I'm going to talk about closed systems. What are the differences between something which is open, light that's been sent off by something, and something which is closed, which has boundaries, where light is contained within something. Now, actually, all, nearly all physical light, the light you see is contained within something. It's contained within the bookends 
of the emitter and the observer. Emitter emission absorption taking place at the same point in space time for the light. So, um, so most most light is uh, as it is observed, bookended. But I'm going to talk about sturdy boxes. I'm going to talk about the idea of putting something into a box and then looking at the weight of the box because this enclosure is necessary. If you want to weigh something, you have to be able to put it on some scales. You have to keep it on the scales. If you want to have an inertial system, then it needs to be inertial within some system. And that system is essential. So to then talk about the inertia of light. So both gravitational um, weight of light and the inertial mass of light. And emphasize that there's a confusion which is often present in people's minds between mass with matter that should not be concerned go, go, they should not be confused with one another matter has mass but you can have mass without matter and then talk about and then reach some conclusions but one thing i'm going to bring into this talk is also and it, it is also connections with the talks earlier this week um mike manthes and and doug masker's talks earlier this week we're talking about clifford algebras i'm going to pull those in absolute the principle of absolute relativity in describing the inertial properties of light and then I'm going to describe what a sturdy box would look like and how to create a sturdy enough box to encapsulate light and that will also be dealt with in the conclusions so quicycle a lot of people have contributed they're up on screen at the moment some of those people but briefly um, so principle of equivalence what's the principle of equivalence Einstein's principle of equivalence is that imagine that you're sitting in some closed system inside a, inside a rocket or on planet Earth, that there is no, provided you're not observing the external universe where you can see a particular frame, of course, you can see the frame of the, for example, the, um, the three Kelvin background. But for a closed box, um, the, 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 the idea is that, the postulate is that no experiment should be able to distinguish the effects of gravitational force, gravitational acceleration, from that an inertial force in an accelerated frame. That, are, that are at least a very large fraction of the things one could do in such a system are equivalent. So this is the principle of equivalence, may or may not be absolutely true, and perhaps isn't in some sense, but this is the, this is the context in which I'm going to look at this. So what are these two things? Inertial mass is a measure of the resistance of an object against a change in its motion, against acceleration. M embodied by Newton's law, F is MA. So, so a force, uh, a body persists in its state of rest or motion until it's acted on by some external force. And no, the no, rate no. of... John, we yes? can't, we can't see anything again. The slides aren't changing, John. Oh my goodness. This is not good. Just a minute. How are we going to do this? <laughs> Whoa, this is not so good. Um, resume share. You just play try it in... Un try unsharing your screen and then sharing from the top. From, okay. the, from the desktop. Okay, let's do that. Just a minute. Um, I'll try a new share. Desktop one. Share. Let's try that. How's that? Can you see that? Yes. Right, now I'll try changing it. Okay. And can you see now a rocket? Yeah, a couple of rockets? Okay. Yes, yes, good. Mighty ho, let's keep, let's keep going on this one. Okay, so I'll just recap those slides, although I think I've had them all. Yes, okay, now I've had them all, that's fine. So here's the principle of equivalence. Inertial mass F is MA, and the mass there is, the constant of proportionality being force and acceleration is the, is, is, is the inertial mass. Gravitational mass, on the other hand, is like a gravitational charge. It quantifies the attraction between, attraction between masses and it's given by F is G M1, M2 over R squared. And there we have the gravitational mass. Now the equivalence principle postulates that these two are the same thing, that, um, that, that, that mass, gravitational mass and inertial mass are identical to one another, but at least they are certainly, uh, all experiments show they're at least proportional to one another with a, with a fixed constant of proportionality. Now, if we're gonna weigh something, if we're gonna weigh something properly, it's actually quite hard to weigh something properly. What you need to do, one needs to, if you're weighing things, you're comparing the gravitational attraction of two objects. So you need something which is like a pair of scales. You need a balance. So this this takes out any 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 um, any little g of any planet one happens to be weighing something on, what gravitational field one happens to be in. 
So we need a pair of scales, a balance. So um, it needs to be pretty heavy. Why does it have to be heavy? It has to be heavy enough to average thermal fluctuations. It has to be heavy enough that, 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 that any quantum mechanical effects are, are averaged out. And um, you really should put the whole thing in a vacuum because otherwise the size of the object, buoyancy matters. And anyway, the buoyancy is also introducing some statistical fluctuations. So you should really stick the thing in a vacuum. So if you've got an opaque box, you don't really know whether what's in the box, whether it's, a, it, 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 it's lead, feathers, air, or indeed photons, as we'll come to see. So if you want to weigh light, imagine we have a box which can, can infinitely reflect light. So you can inject light into it and it bounces around inside and some infinitely reflecting, some perfectly reflecting mirrors. Then, um, then one could imagine injecting light, light energy, each photon with, a, with an energy of easy h nu, being put into the box, how much would that stuff weigh? Well, how light is light? Well, the, the mass is given, uh, the relativistic mass is given by gamma m0 for a, for a rest mass of a, of a, of a, of a material particle, of, mat of a matter particle, of mass m0. So one over gamma is square root of one minus v squared over c squared. So the limit of the mass uh, of, uh, of, 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 of light is that m0 tends to zero as v tends to c. Now, light always moves at c. So this is the justification for saying that light is rest massless. The rest mass of light is zero. But the thing about light is it's always traveling at the speed of light. It's always on the move. So this formula really has little meaning in this particular sense because there's no such thing as a photon at rest. If you can move with a photon in the same frame as the photon moving along with it, just as you catch up with it, it is exactly where it goes to oblivion. It has zero energy if you're traveling at the speed of light with it. And, and, and the corollary indeed that photons could be transformed, could be made for zero energy at that limit is also true. So one could generate very low energy photons for no energy cost at that limit, which is an interesting thing, which I'm not gonna go into further really in the talk, but it's an interesting conjecture. But whatever light photons, E is H nu, contains energy, H nu, H bar, H bar omega. So light contains energy and it has an inertial effect. That inertial effect is that it carries a momentum, which is given by H bar K, which is given, which, which is E over C, uh, the energy of the speed of light is the, is the vector momentum of the, uh, of the photon. So, so in this sense, light has an inertial mass and that inertial mass can be used for example, in a photon sail, it can be measured. It's easy enough to measure. Uh, it's sensitive enough experiments just to measure those uh, that, that inertia well experimentally uh, confirmed. So light does have an inertial mass. So that means that light has an effect on a pair of scales. If you put light on a in a box, in a, re in a reflecting box, in a zero accelerated frame, uh, zero accelerated frame on the left, um, then uh, light will bounce around inside the box uh, and uh, bounce off the top, bounce off the bottom, bounce all around. If the acceleration is zero, uh, then you have a zero uh, a net, net, net force on the base of the box. But if you have a gravitational or an accelerated frame, gravitational frame, then the light will follow a slightly curved path in that accelerated frame. It changes the light is gravitationally blue shifted as it falls or red shifted as it rises through a gravitational potential. Now quantifying that um, is fairly straightforward and well measured. So um, here we're going through that quantification of those things. Um, and what it means, it means that if you imagine light bouncing straight up and down, when it hits the top of the box, it has it, it suffers a, a momentum change of twice the photon momentum because it comes in with a momentum and then bounces back down with the reverse momentum. Uh, when it reaches the bottom of the box, it does the same sort of thing, but it, it's a bigger momentum because it has been gravitationally blue shifted. And if one goes through the, um, if one works out what that is, you look at the Doppler formulas for light, look at K parallel um, and K perpendicular to the uh, direction of the acceleration. Perpendicular, of course, is the same. Parallel gets this extra factor of V over C squared times omega. And one works that out, then by having a look at what the acceleration looks like. So here I have an acceleration of AT, which um, is minus GT, if you like, uh, the according to the postulate of equivalence. Then, then one can work out um, what the difference is in the momentum transfer to the top of the box and the bottom of the box. 
So um, what you do is you have a look at the instantaneous velocity at the top and the bottom. So the thing moves up with distance s is a half at squared in the interval from the light bouncing top and bottom in an accelerated frame. You calculate the momentum transfer in the frame of the box because that's what's, uh, and you, you determine the mass in the rest frame of this, of this light with respect to the point of suspension. So doing that mathematics, fairly straightforward mathematics, one gets uh, this, the round trip trans 2t, and you end up with um, the gravitational mass of such a photon, according to the gravitational redshift, is given by E photon over C squared. In other words, the gravitational mass is exactly the energy divided by C squared. So you get this as well from the, from the formula E equals mc squared. So gravitational mass, so if you take a box, an empty box, no light in it, and you start injecting light energy and you in in introduce a kilogram of light energy into there. So, so, so mc squared, uh, so a kilogram times c squared joules into that thing, you will weigh a kilogram. That box will weigh a kilogram more on your weighing scales. So in this sense, light is heavy. Light is heavy by virtue of energy being he heavy. Any kind of energy is heavy. Any kind of energy introduces weight into a system. The fact that people say that light is massless is just a short form of ignorance. Light is rest massless. Light is not massless. Light is heavy. So that's a fairly quick run through of the gravitational mass of light. Let's have a look at inertial mass of massive light. So looking at inertial mass of light, I'm going to do something else. I'm going to derive relativity in a different way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the linear. The thing is that both energy and square root energy, not square root energy, square root energy is stuff like field, stuff like photon field. The energy density in an electromagnetic field is given by in dimensionless unit, a half e squared plus b squared. In SI units, it's half epsilon e squared plus um, c squared epsilon b squared in terms of if that's in joules if you, if you take b in Tesla and e in volts per meter. But the essential thing is that the energy density in light is proportional to the square of the fields. Now, because fields add linearly and so does energy, to make both do so, you need to do something with space and time to make that happen. And if you want to make both of these do so, that's exactly the transformation um, equations of relativity as I'm going to briefly derive. So to find a single scale factor, that scale factor is going to be a scale factor for field, it's going to be a scale factor for energy, it's going to be the energy of a photon in a particular frame. Frequency also, E is H nu, so if the uh, energy is changing the frequency is 2. Length and time, although some of these are inverses. So to find that scale factor to be R, this is the ratio between the wavelength of a photon in one frame and the weight ratio of the photon in another frame, blue or red shifted. So that red shift or blue shift is the relative scale of anything made from light in the two different frames. So if you have a ruler in one frame, so if we put a ruler in one frame and have a look at it from another frame, it will be relativistically shortened or lengthened according to something which preserves the energy of but preserves the linearity of both field as measured in both frames and of energy as measured in both frames. In all frames, in all possible Lorentz frames, energy is conserved and, 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 and field adds linearly. The Maxwell's equations are valid in any frame. Always were even before the discovery of relativity. So, but it's also the scaling of a Lorentz transformed field. If you have a look at the transformation equations for field, in an in a, in a, in a electromagnetic wave, it's also the relative strength of the field. If you blue shift, the field becomes stronger by that proportionality constant R or one over R. If you take R to be a red shift, if it's blue shifted, it's gonna be one over R that it scales by. Now, I, I did this sum for the first time in, in 2015 and was astonished at the beauty that one gets from changing your view from being one of velocities, square root of one over, Oh, 1 minus v squared over c squared to looking instead at red and blue shifts. One can work these out uh, and you don't need to work them out and look them in a big textbook. The, uh, the red shift, uh, the shift is given by square root of 1 plus, in terms of beta, beta is v over c, velocity divided by the speed of light and the famous gamma factor, which um, 
it's one over the square root of one minus v squared over c squared. You can work these out one in terms of the other. And so the redshift is square root of one plus beta over one minus beta, quite a beautiful symmetric equation. But you can also write it as gamma one plus beta. So same thing, it's just a manipulation of the, of the, of the, uh, of the terms. Now the nice thing is that one over r, well one over r for the square root thing is obviously one minus beta over one plus beta square rooted. But the gamma factor does something very nice. It goes gamma one minus beta for one over r. So in, in, this, in these frames, omega prime is omega r. So r is just the relative change of frequency, the energy change. And lambda prime is lambda over r because obviously lambda and uh, free, uh, wavelength and frequency are inverses of one another or have an inverse relation. So one can also do the same thing for field and the field transformation of a photon, just again, look it up in the big books, it's gamma e plus beta b. But if you have a look at that things in terms of a photon where the modulus of E is the same as the modulus of B and put that equality into the equation, then what you find is that the transformed frame, one, one person's electric field is another person's magnetic field. As you change frame, electric transforms to magnetic partially and magnetic transforms to electric, but precisely in the ratio such that the gain in the field is given again by this factor R. So, so E prime is just R E and B prime is just R B. And of course mod E equals mod B. So what happens in the blue shifted frame is both the electric and magnetic field are increased in modulus by exactly this factor R. But that's all just maths. But the thing that's telling and the thing that's interesting in terms of the inertial mass of light is the reverse transformation. The beta one uh, is V over C, which turns out to be R squared minus one over R squared plus one always less than one, of course. But gamma is the beautiful one. Gamma, normally you write as one over square root one minus V squared over C squared. The form in terms of red and blue shifts is far simpler and far more beautiful. It's a half of R plus one over R. It's a half of the red shift plus the blue shift. So one can now do relativity in one's head. Imagine one goes to a frame, imagine you have a photon which is some color, um, Let's make it green. And you, you, you change to another frame where that photon is frequency doubled. It has twice the energy. You look at it in a different frame where it's twice the energy, it's twice energetic. Its frequency is doubled. Its wavelength is halved. Then, and now stick it in a box. So imagine a photon in a box which is bouncing backwards and forwards. And in the frame of the box, that photon is green. You now transform to a frame where in one direction it transforms as R, it gets blue shifted or red shifted, it gets red shifted in one direction and it gets blue shift in the other because in one direction you're traveling with the motion of the box in the other you're traveling against the motion of the box so let's imagine that in one of those frames it's doubled while in the other one it's halved we can now work out what the integral energy distance difference is in your head before you had a half plus a half which gave you one um, but what you now have is so, so you had one unit going one direction one unit going the other direction what you now have is a half unit going back and two units going forward. So you now have the average of a half and two, so, uh, so th which is one and a quarter. So that, that one and a quarter is just the gamma factor for that transformation. It's just the amount by which the energy in an external frame has changed. So if you've got your light in your box, it weighs a kilo in, in the rest frame, you move it to a, a, a frame where the light is blue shifted to double frequency, the light inside the box now weighs one and a quarter kilos relativistically and it weighs one and a quarter kilos why because the transformation is from one down to zero in one direction and from one up to infinity in the other direction and there's much more room up to infinity than there is down to zero this is an inverse relation and these inverses are fundamental to the way stuff works so half plus two gives you something which is bigger than one plus one obviously do it in your head but the conclusion of this is that confined photons transform exactly like a rest mass. So if you want to look at papers on this, where this is more worked out in more detail, you can look at Martin van der Mark and, uh, and, and Toft, Light is Heavy, 2000 publication, and MB van der Mark, Quantum Particle Light Clock or Heavy Beatbox, which is JFIS conference series references given there, to which the reference to the van der Mark and Toft paper is contained. You can just download it, it's free to anyone. So that's the inertial mass of light in a box. And again, it's just relativistic 
and in a sense it drives what relativity is because if you if you take the experimentally observed um, Doppler shifts of light and then just plug those in you'll get relativity out as well without having to bother with any stuff synchronizing clocks or any nonsense like that just look at the, just look at the redshift and work it out look at the momentum and work it out right good that's established that light is heavy both heavy gravitationally and heavy inertially what i want to do now is i want to think about a bit of a crazy experiment that one doesn't want to try at home putting a bomb in a sturdy box Imagine you have a nuclear bomb sitting in a box on your scales. Now this isn't any old box, this is a very sturdy box. It's um, sturdy enough that a nuclear explosion doesn't bother it very, at all. So, um, so and then you explode the bomb. Um, on, on one side, you have the box on your scales, you put weights on one side to balance the box plus bomb on the other side, you then let off the bomb. What happens? Does, any, does it show up on the scales? Well, Provided that box is sufficiently sturdy, that it contains the nuclear explosion, you will not see a quiver. You will see nothing at all, because all of the energy that was before in the box is still contained within the box. There has been no energy change of the total box. There has been no mass change. There has been nothing to let you know that that nuclear bomb has gone off if that box is sufficiently stiff and strong. Now, what kind of energies are we talking about? If you had a chemical bomb, a firecracker, you're talking about delta M, the change in mass energy from a chemical reaction about less than 10 to the minus nine, one part in 10 to the nine. For a nuclear bomb, um, you're talking about a sort of percentage, less than, less than a percent change, less than 10 to the minus two. But if we're talking about something like an elementary particle annihilation, mass to energy, in other words, mass, um, material mass to photon mass energy, then we're talking about a factor of one. All of the mass has gone to energy. So, but it doesn't matter if the box is sufficiently sturdy, uh, whatever you put in there and whatever you do in there, whatever you mess around in there, provided that the total energy is contained within a sufficiently sturdy box, you'll see nothing. The total energy is just given by E over, is equal to M box C squared, end of story. So the total mass energy before and after the explosion are just the same. So, you don't know the explosion's taken place. Could, could be Schrodinger's uh, cat in there setting off the explosion. You wouldn't know. May or may not have happened. If the distribution of energy may be distributed over different degrees of freedom before and after the explosion, some of it may have become photons, some of it may have become um, heat, some of it may have become fragments of bomb. Doesn't matter. Energy before, energy after, mass before, mass after, same thing. So, in this sense, E equals mc squared is not really a reaction or a transformation equation, but it's expressing the equivalence of, of mass energy through the scalar term m. And you see, this, this, this is a confusion which we learn. We learn to confuse ourselves. One gets used to being confused. There's often a confusion between the words mass and matter. Mass and matter are not the same thing. Matter has mass, but there are things that are massive that are not material. And one of those things is confined light, for example. So if you're talking about a system which is not in a closed box, for example, a radiating light bulb, which is flinging off photons, radiation is generated, but material, but matter is lost. If you, if you have a chemical reaction in which it, photons are emitted, the total mass of the chemical system after the photons have been emitted will be that much smaller than it was before. So in this case, there's a kind of an equivalence between energy and mass in this sense. So, so, so energy is absolutely conserved, or the stelling here is that energy is absolutely conserved. So, right. Okay. That is just talking about things in general in physics as it stands. But what I want to talk about as well, where I want to take this thing further here in this talk is to fit in a little bit of the things that, are, that were being talked about in the beginning of the week by Mike and Doug. I want to talk about um, Clifford algebraic systems. I want to talk about relativistic quantum mechanics. I want to talk about what matter 
not mass, but what matter is a little bit. I want to talk about how to make a sturdy box. How do you make a sufficiently strong box that it can confine gamma rays, that it can stop stuff of the energy of gamma rays getting out of it? Well, that's actually pretty difficult, of course, uh, in terms of uh, thinking about it. We don't, we haven't had up until now a theory that really satisfactorily explains that. But I'm going to try and um, I'm going to propose, I have proposed one 2015 and talked about it quite a lot in Quicycle. If you want to see a lot of the talks on this stuff in more detail, just go to quicycle.com and look at the videos. But I'm going to very quickly go through some of that. And I'm going to, and part of the reason for doing this is uh, in Mike and Doug's talks, they were talking about what was associated in Clifford algebras with which quantities. And while, um, as far as I could see, those associations were correct, both in the questions and in the talk, I didn't see where the justification came for those quantities having those forms. And also it was not quite correct in what was being, it was correct that bivector things, for example, are field, but not that fields are angular, but not those bivectors that carry angular momentum, carry spin, that's not correct. Spin and, spin and angular momentum are fundamental. Uh, angular momentum and, and magnetic field are fundamental, although they're related, they're fundamentally different kinds of things. I wanna show how and why that is very briefly. And I'm gonna do that in terms of um, Williamson van der Mark relativistic quantum electromechanics, quantum mechanics, but including electromagnetism. And in terms of um, an extension of the, the uh, Dirac equation, which treats mass in a dynamical footing instead of just as a lump of mass. And that equation can be written simply as dg equals zero, but d is a Clifford four derivative, a four vector derivative, and g is a general multivector. It's 16 components, it's 32 components if you include the negative um, uh, part of it. Um, dg equals zero is, so you have a four derivative of a 16 component thing, those 16 components are elements of a, of a four dimensional Clifford algebra of space time, the space time algebra introduced by David Hestonese in about 1980. But this new theory is different to the theories that have been proposed by the Cambridge group. Uh, Chris Duran was talked about briefly by Doug yesterday and um, by Hestonese, and that they're not trying to reproduce the Dirac equation, but to go beyond it to encompass Maxwell's equations as well. So this is a new theory, which encompasses all of Maxwell and extends Dirac by treating mass more in, in, in a more similar way to the way that, well, more properly, more, more relativistically properly, I should say. So the simplest form of this equation is dg equals zero. Of course, these derivatives are a little bit more complex than uh, just a standard derivative, Clifford four derivatives. So d is a Clifford Dirac absolute relativity four vector derivative. Now, absolute relativity here means that the derivative is a division. Well, it's, it's d by dt, d by dx, d by dy, d by dz. It has four components, space x, y, z, and a time derivative. But these derivatives, absolute relativity says that the derivative cannot appear without containing its proper unit time for the time derivative and units x, unit y, unit z for the spatial derivatives. So it has the Clifford Dirac algebra, the gamma matrix algebra, it's isomorphic to one of the Dirac gamma matrix algebras, built in. So it's like d slash, in fact it is pretty much identical to d slash if people know what that is in the, um, in the Dirac equation. So I'll come on to that again. I'll say some more about that in a minute. So what's G? Well, the Clifford 16 component multivector is something which has a set of components which have properties under the Lorentz transformation. It's a space-time algebra, it just contains space and time. As Mike mentioned on Monday, this thing doesn't need to be in space and time because the algebra itself is of space and time. So it generates space-time itself by putting the properties as process into the absolute relativistic vectors that one starts generating the algebra with, as Mike talked about a little bit and as I've talked about in previous talks in, in, uh, on Quicycle. So here you have space and time built into the algebra, local space and local time, not some sort of arena in which everything happens, but the space and time are in the theory from the beginning. Now, what does that do? Well, if you put it in combinatorics, the vector, by the way that it's built in, by the process by which it's built in, transforms a four vector by design. 
But what that then does is that leads to other things, which are products, which in, Mike was talking about adding things together, which is really, I would call this a superposition, a superposition of things is, is, um, is the addition. So, so, so he was writing something down like A plus B equals AB. Um, uh, that plus isn't a normal plus where you add two things. It's something where you superpose them with, on top of one another. That leads to, from the relativistic four components, it leads to an extra 12. Some of these transform like rest masses. That is, they are invariant under a Lorentz transformation. They include the scalar part. You have a vector part with four components, you have a scalar part which just has the one component, and a pseudo-scalar part that has one component as well. The scalar and pseudo-scalar turn out to transform exactly as Lorentz invariants. They're not, they don't transform under a Lorentz transformation, like, like the uh, full momentum transfer squared or the, or, or, or the rest mass or the invariant interval. These things are all examples of, of, of something, invariant interval squared. These are all examples of something which is, which is invariant under a Lorentz transformation. The four spin, um, the tri-vector part. So you have a, a, a scalar, a vector, six bivectors, four tri-vectors, and one quadrivector element in this Clifford algebra. The um, tri-vectors transform in a similar way to the vectors. They, they have the same numerical transformation, but um, they have a different, they're different, they differ in detail. Um, if you want to find a talk about that, there's one up on Quisicle where I talked about division and quantum collapse and the relationship between inverses and the way that quantum collapse, the wave function collapse happens. So if you want to have a look at that talk, there's another talk up on Quisicle. But the interesting ones here are the field because that's what pertains to photons and they transform like the electromagnetic field, exactly like the electromagnetic field. Now, I've expanded in the right-hand pane this equation dg equals zero into the standard form that we all know and love but I've kept the multivector form. So for example, the first, um, so I've added, um, the, the alphas on the left tell you what, you are, what, what you're dealing with. So for example, alpha zero is a, is, a, is a unit time vector. That's the first equation. And that's the standard equation that the divergence of E is equal to, all of these terms are separately equal to zero. So each line here is equal to zero, equal to zero, equal to zero. That's expressed at the bottom. So in the absence of mass, P is the, uh, of a mass term, that the first term reads divergence of E is equal to zero. It's a Maxwell equation in the absence of charge. However, if you do put the mass in, what it does, it says divergence of E is equal to minus dP by dt. P is the mass term, and it tells you that the charge in the new theory is a rate of change of mass. It's a mass exchange, which is the way that charge is expressed in quantum electrodynamics. So this theory takes a step from being just the Maxwell equations, it is just the Maxwell's equations. If you take all terms except for the field to be zero, then you get exactly the Maxwell's equations. So you've got divergence of E is zero, divergence of B is zero, you've got the curl B and curl E equations, the first four equations. If you ignore P's and Q's, are just Maxwell's equations, just free space Maxwell's equations, look at them. Uh, although they have these funny multi-vector things in front of them. So this is, this is the new set of equations, but they contain mass and they contain rest mass p, ponderous mass p, and they contain a dual mass q as well, which also comes up as just being a, a, a mass term. So, uh, so they're the equations. So the first four equations are Maxwell's equations with some funny mass stuff in them. The next four equations, here A is the current, but it's not the electromagnetic current. It's not measured in amps. It's measured in um, it, it, it's a, it's, it's a, an energy, it's actually a root energy current. It's the flow. It's, it's like a wave function in quantum mechanics. Psi, the probability density is given by psi star psi. Your A is like a psi. You have to square it to get an energy density. It's a square root energy density. Everything here is the square root energy density and magnetic field, electric field, the masses, um, the, uh, the, the currents and the angular momentum can all be expressed in terms of by judicious choice of, SI units by, in terms of root square root energy density, which is what these things are about. So uh, there are the equations. These are the new equations. Now, wh why am I telling you about all of this? Because um, this is the thing that gives you a possibility to get a box, a sturdy box. So how do you get a sturdy box out of this? Now, 
before, I, before I, I'm going to talk about that in a minute, but what I want to do is focus your attention a little bit on what different things are. What different things are is the B and the E here are fields, they're bivectors. Now, bivectors are things that are, the electric field is, is d vector by d time, so it contains the x by dt, dy by dt, z by dt, it contains an element of space and an element of time, it contains both a unit vector in space and a unit vector in time, and that means that it has two components, it has two indices, and those two indices means that it's a bivector. Now the magnetic field represents a kind of a rotation, but not a spin, because to get a spin, to get an angular momentum, what you need is you need to have a momentum, momentum, dx by dt is a bivector properly, you need to have a momentum which rotates about something perpendicular. So if you have a momentum in one direction, for that to be an angular momentum, it must be rotating about a perpendicular vector. So it has, for example, an x, a y, and a time in it. It's a tri-vector. And spins are necessarily tri-vector objects. Transforming spins, they transform like tri-vectors relativistically. So, so it's not correct to say that a bivector is a spin. It is slightly more complicated than that. It has to be a tri-vector. The, um, the, the vector component here is, is, a, is like a flow. But this is a set of equations, and equations are constraints. So one has to be a little bit careful here to not think about having... You can describe the whole physics either with the first set of four equations or with the second set of four equations, because they are coupled by the equations. The degrees of freedom can be described entirely in terms of field and mass, or in terms of current and spin. But not, you, you, you can't, because an internal wave in this is going to go in the process of waving, it's going to go from, for example, from field to current to another kind of field to angular momentum and come back. It's going around a circle from odd components to even components. The odd components account for all of the energy, as do the even components, because they're coupled. They are, you mustn't double count here in terms of double counting energy, but that's for solutions. That's the subject of future talks. So magnetic field's bivector, but spin is trivector. That's the thing I wanted to bring out of this. But both the mass field equations, that's the first set of four equations, and the current spin set constrain any physics and lead to the emergence of charge. So you need to have both, and in other talks on Quisicle or papers, 1997 paper, myself and Martin, that paper, or the most recent 2019 paper, and uh, talk about um, the emergence of charge, how charge arises from this. It essentially arises from that first, from that second turn at the top on the right, the D0P term, from the rate of change of mass. So, right, that's the basic theory. What does that do for you? It allows you to write down a photon wave function relativistically. So that fully relativistic wave function is given by sine mu nu is equal to um, some prefactor times an exponential. If you look at that exponential on the right hand side, sine mu, the first equation on the page, if you look at the exponential, it's an exponential of all of that stuff on the right hand side. That in the brackets, that alpha 3z is a unit vector in the z direction times the extent of z. So it's a scalar, so it goes. So what that does, that runs from, choose an origin. Uh, if alpha, if, if z is zero, then, then, then you're zero. And what alpha 3 is, it's a vector in the z direction. And what you do is, is that, as, that, as that parameter z runs from zero to infinity in one direction, you vector along that vector. And if it runs in the opposite direction, minus z, you vector in the opposite direction. So that's, that's an absolute relativistic statement of the extent of your wave function in Z, how it moves in Z, how it changes in Z. It, it, it waves in Z, so that's your Z wave, Z wave along the Z direction. And then likewise, you have your T wave, you have an alpha zero T, and that tells you how the thing waves in time. But this wave function, just as a complex wave function, if you take an exponential, if you do e to the um, e to the minus at, you have a falling exponential. You need to put a square root of minus one in there, something that squares to minus one, to turn an exponential into something, a complex exponential, which oscillates. It turns out in these things, you need, this is, we call this the gold standard wave function. It turns out that 
in order to transform that exponential, which is absolutely relativistically required, to something which is an oscillation, which can support waves, you need to do something similar to what you do with complex numbers, but it's hyper complex, it's more complicated. You need to multiply by a unit angular momentum in the z direction. These things essentially incorporate angular momentum into the exponent. And what that does for you, that's what the alpha zero one two does. If you multiply those out, the oscillation in z, it is now oscillating in z, because alpha zero one two three squares to minus one, that oscillation is a transformation. And as you take that wave function, move in Z, you see that E transforms to B, transforms to E, transforms to B, just as the Maxwell's equations always told you, this thing is a solution of the Maxwell's equations. D psi mu nu, D mu psi mu nu is equal to zero, satisfies the Maxwell's equations. This thing, so if you look in space, you see a transformation, space a transformation, just as Mike Manthe said on Monday. Time is not a transformation, it's a rotation. When you multiply the alpha zero by alpha zero one two, you get an alpha one two. And alpha one two is a unit rotation in the one two plane, or effects a unit rotation in the one two plane. So if you sit still in space and look at time, it rotates. If you fix time and move in space, you see a transformation from E to B and back again in this wave function. But the wave function is also limited. You see this R factor here, that R factor is exactly the factor that we just, did, that we just derived. And you see the R appearing in two places, it's the same R see it appearing in the prefactor and, and, and in the uh, exponential. So if I vary that R factor in that equation, now the reason it appears in two places is because of nilpotence. You have something, this satisfies an equation, and that equation relates the exponent to the prefactor. So I've put them both in here just to emphasize that, because I'm putting in here a fixed field, but that field will transform if we go to another field, and the energy will transform if we go to another frame, and the energy will also transform in the same way if we go to another frame by the same amount. So if I'm transforming from one frame to another, I have to both change the rate of change of phase, the, um, the action, these are action variables in the exponent, and I need to change the initial field because the initial field has varied. But that's all fixed by the equation because they couple the two. This is a self-referential thing. Now think about r going to zero, going from zero, going from whatever it is to zero. What happens is the frequency, r omega, omega is the initial frequency, perhaps a green photon, as you, as you redshift and redshift, as r goes to zero, you redshift that energy to oblivion, to nothing at all. At the same time, as, that, as r goes to zero, you redshift your field to oblivion. That wave function describes every single photon described by a single constant related to Planck's constant H0 that I've put in the front here. It's a fully relativistic, transforming relativistically wave function for a photon, for light. That's how it changes. And it is that change which you plug back into the inertial mass formula now to calculate what the inertial mass of photons in a box are. This is doing the maths properly and putting it within the context of a relativistic quantum mechanics. And these things are quantized in angular momentum because what happens as well with this thing is if you look at it laterally, it shrinks laterally because it's actually rotating and that rotation has a frequency and that frequency defines a rotation horizon. So as you look at this thing in another frame, it doesn't only shrink laterally, so it shrinks longitudinally, it shrinks laterally through the rotation as well. Keeping, so it has a fixed angular momentum, which is defined by that constant H0. All photons, all real photons have the same angular momentum H bar. In this wave function, all wave functions have the same angular momentum h bar. In the, in the relativistic um, wave function psi mu nu, and as defined by the mathematics of the Clifford Dirac algebra, which I've used to write down this wave function. So this is a solution of Maxwell's equations. Now, how do you, I promise you a sturdy box. How do you get the sturdy box? How do you get from these equations how do you form something which can confine, self-confine light that can take a gamma ray photon in two gammas and E plus E minus goes to two gammas or reverse process two gammas go to E plus E minus. How do you get that light from the gammas to go round and round circles in electron? What's confining it? Well, what's confining it here is that wave function is a four component wave function like psi mu nu, not a two component wave function. Usually have a real and imaginary part here you have four components in the base wave function, which are reduced to two fields by 
the prefactor of being a photon-like prefactor. Again, see the paper, the 2019 paper, for more details on that. But I want to talk about how you get a sturdy box. Well, what you do is you take Maxwell's equations, which are d mu, the four vector, d slash, if you like, the Dirac four derivative of the field, psi mu nu is the bivector field, electric plus magnetic. If you add a pivot term in psi p, a mass term, then you have the equations on the right, which are the subset of the general equations, dg equals zero, with just field and mass and rest mass, rest mass now. What does it do for you? What it does for you, well, to see what it does for you, you need to go and have a look at um, the energy momentum. You get the energy momentum in a box. Energy momentum is something, it's an energy momentum transfer. So to measure energy or momentum, you need to, well, you need to put it in a box. You, 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 need, to, you need to stop something to measure its momentum. It doesn't have momentum until it hits you. It, it only, a photon transfer is between emitter and observer. And that, that momentum is, the whole momentum is transferred from emitter to absorber, modulo the different frame they may be sitting in, which are described by the transformation equations, which are fully relativistic and work in all frames, which we've just described. So that momentum transfer only occurs within bookends of, of photon emission absorption, if you're talking about photon exchange, or within a perfectly reflecting box, if we're talking about a perfectly reflecting box or an elementary particle, which might contain electromagnetic energy and they do because they're charged and charge is electromagnetic. So if we put the pivot in, what does that do for us? And we calculate what you always calculate for the energy momentum. Uh, so we look at, we look at um, field going one way and then the overlap with field going back the other way. So you have in, in Mike's terms, you add a field and the counter propagating field. In, in my terms, they overlap and that gives you an energy squared. So here we are, just do that. So that's F plus P times F dagger plus P dagger. F is the field going in one direction, F dagger is the field going back in the other direction. Do that sum. If P is zero, you get the energy is just D squared plus B squared, which is normal. That's the energy density in the electromagnetic field in the big textbooks. And uh, for the momentum, you get E cross B, which is the pointing vector, which is in the big textbooks, the momentum density. But you get two new terms. Two new terms, one of them is a rest mass energy density. That's P squared. Your E squared plus P squared are also rest masses, because once you square them, we're talking about a scalar, and scalars are, are masses. They're, they're in the direction of, out of, of um, the pivot of the ponderous mass. But the other one's in a momentum direction. Alpha is I zero is a, is, a, is a unit vector in the momentum direction, in the, in the I direction. That's traveling in the E cross B, but there's an extra term there, which is, which is the ponderous mass times the electric field. Now, what, why does this give you confinement? Well, it gives you confinement because that's a momentum. To get a force, you do the derivative of the momentum. So the total force is gonna be a four vector derivative of this mass energy. But if you have an isolated particle, there is nothing to act, it can only act on itself. So that means that four vector derivative has to be zero. It doesn't mean the elements of it have to be zero, but the resultant has to be zero. The forces have to balance. So the coherence forces to an external in influence, if you want to work it out from these things, for something to confine light, the light has to, the momentum of the light is E cross B traveling in some direction. But now you have a component which is perpendicular to the electric field. If you imagine a charge, the electric field's radial outwards. So you have something which is going perpendicular to the electric field. You have a force which is in the direction. In, in an electron, the electric field's inward. So if you have pivot being positive, then you have a force inwards. So if you have an electromagnetic thing there, it has a component in the direction of E cross B, but it also has a component in the inward direction toward radial direction which means that if those components are equal, it goes round and round in circles. It's, it's, it's confined. It's not, it's not confined by a force. It's confined in force-free motion by virtue of the shape of that momentum. So what an electron is, how does that look like? Well, it looks like this. So here's the theory on the right-hand side. We extend electromagnetism through relativistic quantum mechanics. Energy wraps up into matter. The electron wave function has an element which doesn't have the prefactor with the fields. That's, your, that's my psi there. 
adding a prefactor which has E perpendicular to B in the same magnitude, in other words, the condition on a photon that we all know and love, transforms this into something which is pure field and has two components instead of four components. It's just mass to do that, it's quite easy to show. What happens is photons, which act like twists through space, solutions of Maxwell's equations are shown here, they go into circulating so, um, solutions. Those circulating solutions are a stable solution of this is essentially a double loop, uh, as I've shown several times, and as you can see on Quisicle. So what you end up with is you end up with these double looped systems. That double looping though is, I'm describing this stuff in momentum space. Now, what do I mean by momentum space? Well, if any of you are familiar with solid state physics, um, you, you'll know quite a lot about the fact that you have space space and momentum space. They're both three dimensional and they both they coexist and you can describe quantum mechanics in either. But um, the thing is, or the thing I might talk about at some point in the future and have talked about in the past, is that if you have a four dimensional Dirac Clifford algebra like this, it, and look at the combinatorics of this, that then you find that it contains a set of three dimensional spaces. It contains four three dimensional spaces. The Clifford algebra CL13 contains four spaces. These four spaces are space, X, Y, Z. They are the space of magnetic field, which is different, which is X, T, Y, uh, which is X, Y, Y, Z, Z, X, which are combinations. They're planar, they're bivector things, but that's a three of magnetic field. It contains a three of electric field, X, T, Y, T, Z, T, which are planes in space time. And it contains a three of angular momentum, which is angular momentum about the Z direction, angular momentum about the X direction, angular momentum about the Y direction. So it contains four copies of a three dimensional space as separate subspaces. Now, the thing that this diagram is drawn in is it's drawn in momentum space. So it's drawn in bivector space. So it's not the thing is a double loop in space, it's a double loop in bivector space. But it's a very, very strong effect. The, the, the effect, if we look at this thing externally, it's a spinning object, it's a gyroscope, it's a little spinning gyroscope. The force required, if you work it out in Newtons, is about a, is about a Newton on a, on a single electron. Force required to make that little electron go round and round in a double loop is about a Newton. That's a huge force for a 10 to the minus 13 meter for a tiny little particle. But um, now what it's doing is it's making its own box. The box is made of the interaction between mass and field. And that interaction strength is enormous. Now, there's two ways to see it. One is to calculate it and find out that it's enormous, uh, much stronger than the strong interaction, much stronger than the strong interaction. The other one is just to forget about that and just think about experiment. What happens if you take an electron and zap it into a proton? Protons held together by strong forces. In comes an electron, EMC experiment at CERN I was involved in in the 80s. You zap it with a, with a lepton, lepton comes whizzing in, hits the proton, that proton smashes, it doesn't just smash the bits, it creates new bits, it spangs into huge numbers of other particles which then decay and which you can watch and have fun with in your, in your detectors. It's utterly destroyed by being hit by a fermion. By, by, we use muons, but okay, electrons are perhaps even tougher. And what happens to the muon or the electron you hit it with? Absolutely nothing. It's so strong that it strips and blasts strongly interacting protons into tiny fragments without being touched at all, it's so strong. This is a super strong force. It's a force which is not in the hierarchy of strong, weak, electromagnetic, but you know it's gotta be there, because if you take an electron and just calculate the force due to the electron charge, trying to spang the electron out of it, it, itself, just work it out and then see if the strong force is strong enough to do it. It isn't a clue. But the other thing is, electrons don't feel the strong force. The electron does not feel the strong force. So its interactions are purely electromagnetic. Why? Because the internal strength of the force is so strong, you don't even know it's there. But it has to be there. It, they're previously known as the Poincaré stresses. You kind of forget about this because they're so familiar and so long ago, when it was Poincaré 1903 or something, forget about it. You just know electrons are. 
but something's holding it to, holding that charge together and this is what it is it's the strength of the self interaction of field and mass that's holding that's making this strong enough box to confine this stuff and what it looks like in in momentum space is this outer diagram is momentum space it's a, it's a loop traveling around a torus torus is uh, is denoted by all those uh, all these um uh, gray uh, fog disks, but actually they're all the same disk in real space. So if you project them into real space, you just end up with something which looks like a hedgehog with field coming out in all directions. Here green is electric, blue is magnetic, and red is the momentum direction. And if you project that into, into real space, you end up with a spherical distribution, which just has, in this case, it's a positron you see here as the field pointing out. So just wanted to do a quick comparison to finish off this is the last, I think, slide of content. Just wanted to compare Dirac to the Williamson van der Mark relativistic quantum mechanics. The Dirac, in its simplest form, is written I d slash minus m acting on some spinner wave function is equal to zero. That d slash is a is something that contains the Dirac d slash contains the Dirac gamma matrices, which are isomorphic to these Clifford Dirac um, matrices I'm using. But it's a it's a very beautiful equation, the Dirac equation. But it's got the mass in there as a sort of add-on term. It's not a dynamical mass. It's something which you put into, of course, you know, the thing has to have a rest mass. Um, the Williamson van der Mark equation is simpler. It's just the four derivative of this psi g thing is equal to zero. There's no i. There's no extra mass. The mass is part of the dynamical stuff. And the difference is, in the Dirac equation, the operator is complex. In the Williamson van der Mark equation, the operator is a hypercomplex. Dirac equation gives spin but doesn't touch charge. Williamson van der Mark does spin and charge. In the Dirac equation, it turns out that the, that the psi has to be spinner. Spinner is things that come around 720 degrees before they come back to themselves. It's a mathematical spinner. In our model, you get a physical spinner. It's the reason for the spinner spin all the behavior is a double loop in momentum space. Here, the Dirac equation doesn't really put Maxwell in. You need to put Maxwell into the wave functions as the standard way to do this is with minimal coupling. You can go further than that, so you put it in the vector potential. So you need to add that on as well, and things get complicated when you do that. Here, Maxwell is incorporated from the beginning. The Maxwell equations are a subset of the Williamson van der Mark equations. In the Dirac equation, QED is an extra theory, which you've sort of got some overlaps between the two, but you have both Dirac and quantum electrodynamics and the theory of charges with uh, photon exchange. Here, they're incorporated in the Williamson van der Mark equation and actually give rise to the beginning points of quantum electrodynamics. In the Dirac equation, the mass is static. In the Williamson van der Mark, it's a dynamic part. It's at the same status as the fields. And the Dirac thing doesn't give you the confinement, the reason the electron is bound, but the Williamson van der Mark equation does. So in my view, the Dirac, though it's very beautiful, the U theory is more so. And of course, whether beauty wins is down to nature in experiment and not to, not to me, no matter how beautiful a theory is, if it disagrees with nature, it's wrong. So we'll have to see whether or not that's the case. So to do that, one puts in a set of experimental tests in the new theory, uh, which I'm going to uh, show, uh, but not really go into because I'm running out of, uh, uh, late, or I've run out of my hour. I think I've been talking for just over an hour. So, um, but um, I've talked about these in previous talks in exactly this slide as, uh, I'll go through them very quickly, but I'm not gonna go into depth. You can attempt to generate this free pivot, which I think is possibly dark matter, in the lab with, for example, with field cancellation and probe it. So you could try and make this stuff and see if it, and see what it is. Um, you can look at magnets. You can do that by circulating, uh, anti-rotating strong magnets in a vacuum because magnetic field cancellation can't cancel to zero energy. It must cancel to something. It should cancel to, possibly will cancel to this free pivot. Um, you should expect, in, and, and, and if these things are seen, that there are spin polarized scattering anomalies at moderate energy. So the EMC effect, which I was involved in at CERN, and in the stuff that was done at the zero gradient ZGS at Argonne National Laboratory, people have seen effects in spin scattering that are far stronger than the strong effect, strong interaction. You can look this up. Um, uh, uh, Krish was the leader of the group, and he wrote a good article in May 1979 edition of the Scientific American, which is now available. Um, on, the, on the then spin crisis. The spin crisis got worse with our experiment, um, the MC experiment, and that spin crisis remains a mystery. Anyway, um, but we're using spin here to explain 
what the exclusion principle is. It's not a principle, it's a very strong force. So, um, so, but you should get anomalies at moderate energies and be able to explain them within the new theory. Um, you shouldn't, you can look at the fractional quantum Hall regime and you should not see photon emission unless there's an absorber and nearby in the FQHE. So you can look for radiation from a neutral angular momentum change, which appears in the equations in the second set of equations. Although I think both has to happen. So this may already be happening. And indeed, the strong emission lines all have angular momentum change associated with them. But one test is to just see if it fits all particles and feels better than the competitor theories. Uh, another test that we're developing at the moment with uh, Arnie Ben is a new theory of high temperature superconductors of the dielectrons. Pairs of electrons are spin coupled in this theory. But in any event, whether or not the theory is correct, it's a lovely brain tool for thinking new thoughts and thinking new ways of crystals, de developing new, new materials, new devices, thinking about new devices, sub-electron, electronic devices more information on a single electron than, than one. In fact, a large number of pieces of information can be put in the face space of a single electron, sub-electron electronics. So then Pico technology, looking at, looking at, looking at putting information if essentially down smaller than atomic sizes. So, but eventually the whole, the proof of the pudding here is always in the fact that if you can't calculate with, if you can't use a theory to do engineering, then it's completely useless. And this is a theory which is much simpler than its competitors. So eventually the proof will be by engineering. Imagine it within the new theory, design it, and then let the government sell it for you, which is what they usually do. So that's the possible experiments. So conclusions. Conclusions, light is heavy. Watch out for the confusion between matter and mass. The key to energy as mass is how you confine it. You have to keep it in the box in order to weigh it or to measure its inertia. So the mass of a closed system or its energy is always conserved. And E equals mc squared expresses a kind of equivalence between mass and energy. It's not about transformation. And matter is just confined. It's canned energy. It's a box with internal dynamics. And you know that elementary particles have internal dynamics because they have a washing list of properties. They have spin, they have lepton number, they have an immense number of internal properties that you cannot really ascribe to a point particle. So the new relativistic quantum theory provides a mechanism for self-confinement of light and both that confined light and the box itself contribute to the mass of material particles, whatever the box is. And a raft of experimental proposals to test the new theory has been proposed. And so, and that is the end of the talk. So I shall stop sharing briefly shall i and uh, and open the floor to questions great thank you john okay well lou lou yeah yes. do do you get quarks as um as trapped circular gluon fields out of your theory no not circular but yes we do get quarks so, 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 and we get the quark symmetries as well, both the quark symmetries in the dance of the quarks. So they're precisely not circular. They are almost circular. What, in the theory, what, what, what does that mean? Right, I'll tell you, here we go. Here we go. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna try and do the dance of the quark with fingers. So there's gonna be a bit of hand waving going on here. Look, an electron goes doubly loop, goes round twice. So that goes round and round. Now, Imagine you take something like, well, take an electron and say, okay, but um, let's just take this electron not going quite round and round. Let's get it go round three quarters. So it goes from something which started out traveling in X to something which is traveling in Y. And now it's a loose end. It's no longer a particle because it's not a continuous loop. So you've got something which is electron-like, but it's got kind of, it looks like this. It goes in, it comes round, comes out. So it's like that. Now, um, one of those is not a particle because it's unbound. But if it's got a friend, another electron, that does exactly the same thing, that goes round and goes in one direction, comes out, but it does it in a figure of eight, like this, so one's left-handed and the other's right-handed, then you can have going x to y and then y t to minus x, x t to y, y t to minus x. You have a continuous loop where you can plug these things together. They're not overlapping, but they're next to each other, like Lego where you have a continuous particle, which is an almost electron plus an almost electron sitting in the same space because 
We're talking about this in momentum space, so this shape is in momentum space, but in physical space, it's got nothing to rotate about but itself. It's going to be spherically symmetric in, the, in, in real space, but it's going to have an internal symmetry, which is a loop, anti-loop, loop, anti-loop, loop, anti-loop anti symmetry. Now, identify a quark with loop and an anti-quark with an anti-loop, so left-handed and right-handed. Now you have a mechanism for producing uh, baryons. These, these are, that's a meson. A quark anti quark is a meson. So that's quark anti quark within the new theory. Now, um, what, about, what about hadrons? What about strongly interacting protons, neutrons, these kind of things? Well, they're supposed to contain three quarks, and they do, but they don't contain three partons. The quark mass parton model was disproved a long time ago. The original quark model, Gelman's model, is beautiful. The symmetries are correct. However, identifying those things with partons has just led to a dog's breakfast of utter nonsense in terms of the experimental results. Now, I know this personally because my PhD was on this and I did a postdoc on this. We know, as professional high energy physicists within the field, how much crap there really is in the theory, really, just frankly. Just don't mess about, just say it. It is nonsense. You measure. You, you don't see the you don't see the quarks. You don't see a third of the momentum of a proton in the quarks. You see the thing down way down in the momentum transfer in X. You see a, a you see a, a mess of gluons and valence quarks and it's horrible. You cannot simply identify the quarks as a, as, as a hard bit inside the proton. And in fact, sometimes you scatter off protons and, well, very, very rarely, but you see half of the momentum of the proton coming in and scattering, as well as but most of the time you see sort of, and as you hit it harder and harder, you see less and less. You see, you used to see 10 to the minus two, you now see 10 to the minus three or 10 to the minus four of the mass of the, the proton. So it's not, a, it's not a hard bit, but the identification of quarks with partons is lots of problematic also with the spin. That's the proton spin crisis, you know, from the MC effect and, you know, from Z ZGS data. So, but okay, here we're talking about something which is geometrical and which is really a, a confined photon. Confined photons are soft. Uh, they're, they're extremely strongly bound in that the spin is, the top topology of, the, of an electron is, can't be broken without, without an anti, without a positron, really. It's... Uh, it's a fantastically powerful gyroscope. Anyway, coming back to the hadrons. Hadrons, okay, so imagine you've only got a left hands, but you've got three of them. So this is, this is an alien creature, but never mind. We have three left hands. So we now have X, T, Y, or you could equivalently do Y, T, Z, or Z, T, X. You can't do X, T, Z, because that would be left-handed. Sorry, I'm using a left hand here, but never mind. You only have one-handedness. Now, if you do that, then the only way to fit the things around in to give a complete loop you go x to y and then you go y to z you still haven't made it because you've not gone back to where you started from you need to go x y y z z x you need three of them of the same handedness to make a complete particle and that's what the baryons are and that's the reason that you only see three quarks and the reason you see quark anti quark pairs and that's all it's just geometric the quark model is absolutely and I've talked about this in Quesicle in the past as well, so uh, briefly, but I should do a whole talk on, uh, on hadronic physics at some stage because it needs to be fixed. So, yes, now, it's, it's not a complete loop. It's a three-quarter loop, but then it's two three-quarter loops. So I suppose that's one and a half loops, isn't it? So, uh, <laughs> so for, for, for a meson, and uh, what, what is it? It's three, three, well, whatever that is for a hat. What, three times three quarters, nine quarters. Well, that's not a very nice number, but anyway, never mind. But, but, but these things exist not only as elementary particles in and of themselves, but those shapes also exist in exactly the same in the quasi-particles in the solid state. So if you take an electron and, and take an electron in free space, it's 10 to the minus, okay, it's thought in quantum electrodynamic in, to be a point particle smaller than 10 to the minus 18 meters. Classical radius of the electron, 10 to the minus 15. Take it to um, uh, the Compton wavelengths about 10 to the minus 13 meters, stick it in a hydrogen atom, it's 10 to the minus 10 meters. Put it in a solid state crystal, it's tens of nanometers. Put it in a superconductor, it's as big as the superconductor. These electrons expand out, but they have the same topology. And it is the topology that defines the electron, not its mass. Its mass is defined by its interaction with, other, with the rest of the universe. And that interaction is modified by its environment. If you put it in a hydrogen atom, most of the interaction is between the electron and the proton. There's very little that escapes outside. The charge outside uh, 10 to the minus 10 meters is zero. Perfect cancellation, they're both spherical. 
So it doesn't interact anymore with anything else. It just interacts internally, mostly, not quite, but mostly. That's why it booms up in size because its interaction is so reduced. But if it interacts more, it gains more energy from the universe, it shrinks. So if you take an electron out of proton, it shrinks down to its interaction with the rest of the universe, which you can calculate as well. And if you calculate it, you find that the exchange energy is just what you need to get your one Newton confinement to make things go around around the circles of 10 to the minus 13 meters. So, but that's another talk. Okay, okay. Peter. Okay. More questions. Do the Peter. quarks have fractional charges? No. no. Mu. The answer is it is not known. Right. Um, right. And, and I, so, so, so I prefer the Han Nambu model, which I think we've talked about before. You've talked yeah. about before. As I well. talked about in this series. I, I, saw it. Model, I saw it. So, maybe you could uh, look at my talk on that. No, but I'll tell you what. what yes, I've, all, no, I've already seen your talk, so I don't need to look at it. And it's a brilliant talk, so thank you for that. And you're, I think Han Nambu is better. Um, my thesis was on measuring the charge of the quarks and it can be done in principle but what you need is is high statistics and um, what you need to do is you need to look at the asymmetry between mu plus and mu minus because it shows up in the in the asymmetry now the um, result of my thesis was that there was no result we couldn't distinguish the charge of the quarks and as far as I'm aware and I'm, we have a large group here I'll stand corrected if otherwise. I don't think there's been any measurement of the charge of the quark since I put down my pen in 1980-something. So, um, so I think that it's still unknown what the charge on the quarks are. But as I said, I don't think the quarks are physical objects in the sense that they are separate from the whole hadron flow that's required to give you a complete particle. And I think the quark model is beautiful and correct. So, but um, but um. I would prefer Han Nambu quarks because if you've got a three quarter electron, it's very nearly one charge. And maybe they're not quite one, but well, maybe three quarters or, or fractionally charged. Now at the moment I'm working on a, on a theory um, of multiple electrons of dielectrons specifically in superconductivity with Arnie Ben partly. Uh, but, um, but the fractional charges in the, in the, in the, in the quantum Hall liquid in the fractional quantum Hall liquid are also up for grabs here because then what one's, what, what one's doing there, I mean, the theory there is, Pretty beautiful. And I don't think it's complete yet because I think what you need to do is you need to actually associate a set of flux quanta with a single electron. And I've thought this for a long time, but uh, I haven't really had the extra energy to get into trying to do the maths or the fractional quantum Hall effect stuff, although somebody should do that. Probably, probably me now. Um, but nonetheless, I think that's an interesting thing to do. And I think in that sense, in the sense there's a coupling between magnetic quantization and electric quantization, that there are, you, you can view this in a fractional charge. And in fact, one of the experiments I just proposed was to say, if you go into the fractional quantum Hall regime, so imagine you go to the one third plateau, so high magnetic field and, uh, and very low density electrons, then the, the photon angular momentum quantization comes from the effective charge of these things. I think that thing should emit one third angular momentum photons. However, it cannot do that because the interact, if the interaction with absorber, Feynman-Wheeler theory is correct, that means that such photons would not be absorbed, but would not be emitted because there's nothing to absorb them. So an experiment there is to go into the fraction quantum Hall regime, try and emit photons, just electromagnetic photons. They won't emit, but if you have a, an antenna nearby, which you can put into the fractional quantum Hall regime, as you turn that antenna on, you should see the uh, emitter light up and start emitting on the fractional uh, angular momentum photons, which are then absorbed by the fractional momentum system uh, of the fractional quantum Hall effects. That's a, an experiment which I propose to talk about, to talk about fractional angular momentum photons. But there's also some interesting results as well. Um, I forget who the guy did it, uh, about fat photons, P-H-A-T photons, which are photons which have multiples of angular momentum. So, and the multiples are one, four, nine, H bar, I believe. Now, there's a re within the theory, there's also an, an understanding of how those things happen because they are superposed systems. It's coming about through the same effect that gives you the exclusion principle. So, but that's another talk again. But, 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 um, but as far as I know, uh, uh, this is going out in public over the whole world. I don't think, it, uh, I'm not aware of an experiment that's, uh, that has yet measured the charge of the so-called patterns within within nucleons. Okay, more questions? 
then Joseph, and then Anton. Doug? Yeah. Hey, brilliant. Um, it's clear that there's a lot smarter people in the world than me. <laughs> people who were doing this kind of math, uh, which is why I did the math I did, because it was all the math I could do. Um, but, but, but the particular thing that caught my attention was this one slide where you said, magnetic field is bivector and spin yeah. trivector, okay? Yeah. I, Mike and I kind of are talking about this all the time as well. And we agree that the magnetic is a bivector. And in fact, if you look at why, you know, people talk about bivector, there's no magnetic monopole, right? Okay. But if you look at it from a plane perspective, it's a plane. Well, you can't, it's only the orientation of the plane. Well, you can't separate the plane unless you have another plane between there. You know, it's, you just can't do it. So from a magnetic monopole, whole perspective there isn't really one but there's you could all those planes to give you the magnetic effect right and but uh, some let, people are actually let, 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 let me just interrupt you and just say yeah that, so i want you to comment on that and, but i also like to ask you about the trivector what your interpretation of that so coming up but first thing and let me say thank you both to mike and to you because i did this for you that stuff was put in because of your talks okay mike, great and thanks. Talk on monday and tuesday because you were struggling a little bit with understanding that, but you were right. The magnetic field is bivector. So where you got that from, whatever you did, you, you put, the, you put the bits. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> wherever, wherever Mike got that from, you put the bits together correctly and it is bivector. That's absolutely right. But then both Mike and you were asked questions about spin and you both, in my view, got it wrong in terms of yeah. talking about what spin was. So, but let me come back to your second question, which is what's the difference and what's the trivector difference? Look, mm -hmm. the thing is that what I'm doing in this mathematics is I'm continuously making the mathematics more constrained. So when I was asking the talk, of, when I was asking on Mike's talk in the discussion afterwards, what his metric was, and he was using plus, 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 plus metric, you were using this metric. That's kind of fine. And you can fix all of this by putting judicious use of complex numbers, because you can say, okay, well, if we're sitting in a complex Clifford space, then you can always choose what the thing squares to by sticking eyes in where you want. So, but that system is too floppy if you're talking about the real the process of reality mm -hmm. reality has to be specific it has to match exactly just and no more what reality does put an extra degree of freedom in there you get a whole bunch of things that don't happen in reality because you put an extra degree of freedom in. Now, you guys are doing that at the moment and you're not really looking at the physics of this True. and tying it just, down to the physics right, so i thought like yeah and, and wolf, wolf asked questions about this as well and your, your answers to Wolf were just completely off. Well, you didn't know what to answer. So, 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 but I thought I'd do that partly for Wolf, uh, but, mm -hmm. but also partly for you guys to tie these things down to the physics. Now yeah. to do that tying down, you need to get more specific. You need to get more exact yeah. with what you're doing in your Clifford algebra. But also, but to answer your question, really for the angular momentum, look, I'm gonna do vectors, vectors of flow. Now, if you wanna look at momentum, if you want to look at velocity, velocity is dx by dt. It's a little bit of space divided by a little bit of time. Mm -hmm. Now, if you take relativity, relativity as a process and you take it seriously, then if you're really going to divide a little bit of space by a little bit of time, you better get your space vector correct. A little bit of space is not just, it, it is a unit vector of space times an amount. Just what you're saying, you can have plus one, minus one, zero, but you can also have plus two, plus 2.3 just by putting more and more of this vector in. You can have anything you like, but you can also have zero and then it's not there at all. So you can have null, null plus and minus. That's absolutely correct. And if you're talking about a quantized system, it's gonna be null plus or minus one. So the coming, but going into that system, if you're doing velocity, you're doing dx by dt. That's a bit of space divided by a bit of time. Now that is a bivector thing because it has xness and it has tness. It has two components. Velocity is bivector. It never was a vector. Now, you know it never was a vector because it doesn't add like a vector. Yes. You can't any more go faster than light. You go north of the North Pole. You, you have these limitations on things because the thing ain't a vector. It's a bivector. And bivectors go round and round in circles. So once you've gone round in the circle, you just go round in the circle again. So you have a limitation. That limitation is the speed of light. So it's expressed by unit space divided by unit time, which is a unit bivector, which is a 90 degree turn. So understanding sort of the meaning of these topological primitives, like you're yes. doing right now, that conversation you just had, and what I, and Mike and I have about this, what is this little spin? 
a plane? What what is it? You know. And, Doug, but you and Mike and I need to talk. Yeah, we do. Because it's not going to be answered and right I just now. Don't your brain about this because yep. you know Mike been doing this. So I know. The last this is, question is: This tri vector. Mike thinks it's the electrical thing because no, it's co-boundary of the electron, no. and you're no, calling no, no, it the no. spin. So I want to know what you, why you think that. No, no, no. So look, look, you guys are kind of. You're doing a fantastic job, I have to say. It's absolutely marvelous. But but you, you're completely in the dark as, as to the physics. And, True. And, and we're not, we're not trying to solve to, the physics. We're trying to understand yeah. what this apology means. Yeah. You're trying to understand the maths. Now, I can fill you in on the physics. And, uh, and right. that's a great proposal, but it's not correct. The, the charge mm -hmm. is coming from an exchange. So charge is essentially something which is an exchange, which is coming from an interaction yeah. between other forces. The charge is, if you only had one electron, it doesn't have a charge because there's nothing for it to interact with. So, 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 so that's kind of down a level and the charge is really an E0. It's a time-like vector in, in the proper theory, not a tri-vector, although it has some of the properties of a tri-vector. No, but look, let, let's do angular momentum now. We've got momentum. Momentum is dx by dt. So it's traveling in the x direction with, um, at, at the speed of light. It's a photon, right? Now, okay, if we now take another vector, let's take a y vector, and it travels around that y vector. So it's, well, we take it in three, we don't need to take x, y, z, we take r, theta, phi. So imagine it's traveling in the, in the phi direction, and you put a radius in. But it's now gonna rotate around that radius. So you've now got r and phi and t, mm -hmm. three indices, all mutually perpendicular. So if you yeah. like, it's x, y, t, or r, phi, t. That's mm -hmm. a tri vector. Count them one, two, three. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, 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 uh, basis for that's right. so you have two things going on. One is the dimension of the thing, the physical dimension, which is whatever it is, um, uh, um, uh, meter squared, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, whatever, whatever those physical dimensions are, and some things have the same physical dimensions. For example, torque and energy have the same physical. You know, force times distance it is. If it's perpendicular, it's a it's a, it's a torque. If it's parallel, it's an energy work done. Yep. So they have the same physical the, the dimensions in terms of that, but they have a different nature. Um, okay. Energy so, is... So it sounds like we can talk about this for a long time and maybe we should get some time for other people to have questions. No, I don't think so. I think this is almost the most important thing there is. This is why I'm doing it. So, but, but yeah, we do also have to talk for a long time. But, <laughs> but, but not, just, not just you and I, but there are one or two other people yeah. that should come in on yeah, the conversation exactly. too. Lou, for example, I'm sure wouldn't would 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 make a, and and Peter would be fantastic, uh, co 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 conspirators in some of this stuff, and uh, other people who know about Clifford algebras as well would be very welcome to come in, but 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 yes no we do need to talk longer but the angular momentum x y t or r um, r psi t it's a triadex yeah, obviously so yeah. so it, it has those dimensions and that that is a spin that's a spin because that's momentum going around around circles, R cross P, which I, is- <laughs> I posted uh, Chris Doran, a link to Chris Doran's PDF that he somehow was on the web out there on, in, the, in the Zoom chat. Uh, so yeah. anybody who wants- well, I'm, I'm very familiar. Yeah. The Cambridge group did a lot of good work in terms of describing physics as it is, and, uh, yeah. and uh, Lunesta as well, and Finland as well. So, yeah. but I think they, they're in a similar position to you, although- Remember, I'm, I'm an engineer, not a mathematician or a physicist. So I only yeah, work on well, stuff I can work on. So <laughs> well, I'm, a, I'm a physicist first, an engineer second, and a mathematical physicist third, and then nothing, nothing else. Yeah. Anyway, but nonetheless, I, I was in the engineering department for 30 years. Yeah. I did a lot of engineering. So. Yeah. But, but, but me too, in other words. <laughs> yeah, but exactly. they. We do what uh, we can. <laughs> we do what we can. But what they've done is they've done a very good job, and, and Hestonies too, of trying to describe physics as it is in terms of a Clifford algebra, and that's very nice. But they haven't, uh, at least as far as I know, and they will correct me at some point if I'm wrong, sort of come in and, 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 and used that algebra to, to go somewhere new and to do a new theory, which is simpler. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I think the problem they had, and I, and I know where they got stuck, they had this thing called the space-time split, which Martin and I used a rude word for that instead when, once we read all this stuff. <laughs> we didn't use split, we used, well, you can make up your own rude word at that point because at that point they went into the mist because they're trying to project these things onto two different vectors. So, mm -hmm. so at that stage, they've screwed their maths. Yeah, exactly. And as soon as you screw your maths and, and they think they're doing it for the physics. And the reason I think they think, I 
I, I don't know why they've done it, but the reason I think they might have done it is a conviction that the electric field is a vector and it had to be a vector. It never was a vector, it never will be a vector, it's a bivector. It's bi and as soon as you do the projection, you are actually forcing the 3D space onto a 4D space. And at that stage, you have gone into the mist, you're never going to get anywhere. And Chris, uh, Gull, Lazenby, Duran, the, the Cambridge group, seemed to me to be following that. I don't know whether it was because they wanted... It is difficult to publish stuff in new areas, as we've discussed before. So it might be that they wanted to try and stick to something which is as conventional as possible. And privately, they thought about this kind of thing. But I've seen no evidence that that's the case. So I think they only went so far in the Cambridge group. Okay. And uh, thanks for your predictions, too. I like that. Um, and well, I'll be, in my next talk, I'll be doing some more predictions, too, to, to tie the fact that maybe thought is related to quantum mechanics, too. And that's the big part of my talk next time. So, you know, well, so I was, I was, I really want to talk to, to, to Mike and you for another reason. I was completely fascinated by the combinatorics that Mike was talking about on on Monday, and I want to talk more about that as well. So I'm okay. looking forward to that. Anyway, perhaps you're right though, we should ask for some other questions. We need to form a little group here and talk about Clifford algebras. So, yeah. so the that, other thing is happen. for the FISC conf conferences that I have, I have a hidden link that has all the papers on. So if anyone wants the FISC conf conference papers, um, I will post it to AMPA chat. So good. But anybody can get that though. So that can be more questions. Okay, Joseph is next. Yes, uh, thank you. I do not follow all of the quantum physics, but I have a feeling it is very new and potentially very useful for those of us who are not uh, quantum physicists. I think that th it can help to redefine the interface between quantum mechanics and macroscopic levels of reality. It, to do that, you have to, uh, I think, make some assumptions about what the structures of interactions, complex interactions between people, societies, what have you, might be formulatable using some of these ideas, such as root energy, which is to me a, something I would like to learn more about, but it certainly does seem to fit the idea that uh, energy is fundamental in some way that needs to be better described. And that the consequences for processes, which I call, well, I'll call them real, but you mean, when I say real, I mean macroscopically real processes, have some characteristics that uh, do not commute do not distribute, and these can be identified and perhaps brought into relation later to some of the aspects that I see lurking in the background, but maybe there it's my imagination. No, it's not, it's not, it's not Joe. If you have a, everybody should have a look at quicycle.com. We've been, several of us um, staring out at me from, have been doing talks for, for months. And there, there are a set of things there. One of the talks I gave was on, on quantum collapse, on quantum transport and quantum collapse. That has to do with what Wolf was talking about last time as well, that look, for each one of us, the cutting edge of reality is right at the present moment. We are the absolute cutting edge point of time moving forward. Everything that interacts with us is in our past. So the point at which free will happens is for each one of us where we are at the moment. Now, the interactions that we have coming in are in interactions. They are exactly that. They are things which are, if they're photon interactions, they're at the same point of space-time, which is the cutting edge of space-time for us because everything's at the same point for the photon. So, so that whole thing coming from the past to the point of the present is focused on the observer. On the, on, on, it is the observer where the whole thing is happening. So if you're looking at a... If, if Wheeler and Feynman are correct, and I believe they are... And, there are a small band of us, Carver Mead's another one, gave a very good talk on this, who believe that things don't interact, and that's one of the experimental proselytes gave, unless there is both an emitter, an emitter can't emit unless there's an absorber to absorb it. Now that absorber's got to be in the emitter's future. The asymmetry between past and future is that, is that, is that if you're looking into the past, you're gaining energy from the past. Energy's, you see energy coming in. 
if you're if you're if you're an emitter if you're radiating energy you're pissing it off into the future it's going it's gone you never know what happens to it because it's outside your light cone as soon as it's emitted so there's a symmetry in the direction of time is the direction of energy transfer and and if the if the transfer requires both the emitter and the absorber and for the photon the transformation equations of space and time space and time are really illusions not 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 a reality that are within the mathematics of reality which um solution to Hilbert's six problem, whatever that is, within the mathematics of reality, then, then there's an actual intimate connection between emission and absorption, which puts them at the same point in space-time for the photon. And what that means, it means that you're truly in touch, really in touch. If you're looking at, a light, at Alpha Centauri, you're seeing light that came four years ago, but it really is, your eye is really on the star and the star is really in your eye for that individual interaction. And, you, and, and your, your interaction with the universe is painted by the sum of all those interactions which come in in 3D and give you the illusion of living in a three-dimensional monkey world where, um, where in fact it's really more complicated than 3D. It's at least four three-dimensional worlds superimposed. So, so yes, I mean, these things are connected. And in, in terms of quantum interaction, quantum transport and quantum collapse, the quantum collapse is always between one point and another point between the emitter and the absorber. Everything else in between is irrelevant to that emission absorption event. Everything else is, is hidden from the emitter and absorber because the emitter and absorber for light are at the same point in space time. So, so for them, the entire universe is local to light. These are local interactions. They're not non-local interactions. And this is the big mistake, I think, Sam, I'm very sorry about this, in the whole field of quantum computing and so forth, is that people talk about Alice's and Bob's and the Alice's and Bob's do something and then do something in between and do something else to some quantum state, which is not allowed because quantum states are intimately connected. There is no something happens and then something happens. There's only simultaneity, which is, I completely agree with what Mike was saying, Doug. Uh, is Mike here today? I agree. Yeah. So, um, so simultaneity, uh, I'm trying to find some parallels to what Lupasco wrote because it seemed to be Priestian. Mm -hmm. And he, he said that, and I quote, so that it can be shot down if you wish or, or continued. He has no, has no background space time. He has, there's always some time and space and some space and time mm -hmm. and uh, simultaneously, simultaneity and succession are also not separate. Set, totally separated. And so he, he was trying to see some dynamics in his crude, my crude language, uh, that corresponds to what some of what you might be saying. And that's where I would like to find mm -hmm. bridges if there are, or make sure there aren't any. Well, I'm not familiar with that work, and it sounds interesting. Um, but there are a large number, there are uh, Okay, a small percentage, but nonetheless, a, a fairly large number of people who worry about this. Jan Hilgerford was another person who, who, who thought about- Sorry, what um, name? Hilgerford. I'll stick it onto, I'll stick it into the chat. Yeah. Oh, can I type it into the chat? Yeah, okay, yeah, it's up in the chat. Jan Hilgerford uh, talked about, he wrote a paper called Space Arena or Illusion. And, uh, and, and uh, again, talking about the possibility that, look, whatever, I really do not believe there are two copies of this. I don't believe there's a space and a space in space, but space exists in space, if you see what I mean. I think there really is just one. And, and, and so, look, you can't really separate those things. If you're talking about space, there is only this one space. We're trapped in space, we're of space. So, so, but I think it really makes absolutely no sense to say that, that those spatial coordinates are in a space. You have to take the space as being fundamental, but well, you, you may not, but then you do have two copies. And where do the two copies come from? One of them's just made up. The other one is in a space of interactions and interactions are much more real than something that you make up in your mind. Now, but those interactions are intermediated pretty much for everything we see, touch, taste, hear by photons. And those photons are done the three-dimensional space in which those things happen is a double bivector space. So, um, and that double bivector space is also at light speed. And light is heavy. It's not just heavy by being weighty. 
It's heavy by being the old feeling of what heavy means in that it's complicated. Because what light does, it squashes space-time down to something which is two-dimensional. The dimension along the travel of space is Lorentz transformed to nothing. And you end up with just a ring, with just a two-dimensional system. So each individual um, photon interaction can be seen in two dimensions as uh, the, the dimension on which it travels and time is squashed to nothing by CT squared minus, minus R squared, whatever that is, whatever the R is between the two interactions. So, um, so, so light complicates the, you, you, have to be, you have to be with it. You have to take all of the consequences, not mess around and try and think in one way and then think in another way, but, but, but think, okay, there is only one space time what are the consequences of that? How does that transform into interaction space? What are the interaction spaces? The interaction space is already composite. In, in, in Mike's terms, it's, uh, for example, X plus T to give you the electric field and X plus Y to give you the Z component of the magnetic field. But, but plus doesn't mean you add them. It means you superimpose them. You concatenate them in some way. So um, it is complicated, but you I'm pretty much convinced that you don't want to have both. You don't have magnetic field in space and electric field in space and space in space and angular momentum in space. What is this other space which these spaces are in? I don't think so. I think, I think that the, the space is contained in the interactions which that space is allowed to have in the, in the processes which it, in the constraints that you place on it. And the constraints, you must be aware of all the constraints at once. The constraints are not just Maxwell's equations. They're Maxwell's equations plus conservation of energy. They're not just Maxwell's equations plus conservation of energy. They're Maxwell's equations plus conservation of energy plus unitarity. Because you need to have, the only kind of processes that are going to be allowed are going to be unitary processes. And if you look at this algebra, Clifford algebra, the Clifford algebra is not a division algebra. So, so, so if you're doing inverses, you pretty much want to have division. But, but division only works in a unitary way if it's in a single component. As soon as you add a double, couple of components, you get something that looks py pyth Pythagorean, but relativistically Pythagorean, and you get numbers coming in which are gonna either expand or contract and either blow up or go to zero, which is not exactly a physical kind of thing that things kind of do. So, so this is probably why the kind of differential we need is d by dx separate to and linearly independent from d by dy, separate to and linearly independent from d by dz, and all of them separate and linearly independent from d by dt. And that's all, except for possibly d by dx, y, d by dz, t, et cetera, which you might have, which are also unitary. But, um, but there are only some of them, some of the combinations in the Clifford space, which give you unitarity. So you've got unitarity, you've got conservation of energy, conservation of momentum, you've got these constraints, which are in the background, which you really need to have in your mind at once if you're going to think properly physically about how stuff works. So, and it's not easy to do, of course, and one needs a bit of practice and read a few big books. But, um, but anyway, I, I don't know if that, did that answer most of the questions there? I, I mean, the, 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 this simultaneity thing, this locality thing is extremely important to understand and to and to take very seriously in terms of what interactions are allowed. You've got to have relativity working, you've got to have the right transformations working, you've got to have unitarity, conservation of energy, conservation of momentum, conservation of angular momentum, that's a big one. Because if stuff's spinning, uh, like Colin was talking about, if you have embedded galaxies, they're spinning and other things are spinning with them and you have to think about the mutuality of spin and anti-spin. Uh, spin, is, spin is crucial, spin is the key. And spin is also where all the experiments are going, ah, what's going on here? It's not working, spin crisis. Where you need to look is at the crises and fix the crises, not at the stuff that you think you understand because you probably don't, at least I don't. Anton had a question. Anton, yes, sir. On your figure of eight electron, um, does this electron stay a figure of eight while it orbits a, a, a proton? Uh, that's question number one. And question number two, with your theories, have you got any ideas why the helium atom has got four times the weight of a hydrogen atom? It hasn't. It's a bit less. Yes, I do. But no, first of all... I know it's a bit less, you know, but it's... Uh, yes. Yes, no, we're working on it at the moment. We're doing chemistry. Arnie and I are doing chemistry. Yes, we know exactly why. And if you've looked at some of Viv's talks as well, he's talked about exactly why this is all happening. Helium's a tri-boson. Hel helium's a fantastic thing. Um, uh, so, sorry, there are a lot of questions there, Anton. They're very good. First of all, 
the electron around the hydrogen atom is not a figure of eight. The figure of eight thing was the, was the meson. The, ele the electrons going around a double loop in the same direction. It's not a figure of eight. And it's not Mobius. The other thing it's not is Mobius. Everybody sees this and thinks it's a Mobius strip. No, it's a full twist, not a half twist. Mm -hmm. It's not Mobius. And it's not a figure of eight. But however, the meson is. But in, in the helium atom, in the helium atom, it's also not a figure of eight. It's perfectly spherically symmetric. Everything's in the S state. So there's no, there's, but what is happening is the spins are cancelling. The thing's a tri boson. You have a pair of electrons. The electrons are in a boson state. They're in a spin up, spin down state. So spin zero, they're singlet state. So, so what's happening there is that the electrons are actually in the same space. Now, if you take two electrons and put them into the same quantum mechanical space, and they're really field, so you have something which is exactly on top of the other electron, the field doubles everywhere because fields add linearly, right? But the energy goes as the square of the field. So if you took an electron and tried to superimpose another electron in exactly the same space, you'd have double the field and hence four times the energy. In other words, there's an exclusion principle operating, which is operating at the level of doubling the total mass of the system, stronger than strong. That's the Pauli exclusion principle at work. I gave a paper on this 2012 at Mendel conference, but it's uh, not very well worked out and I'm not particularly proud of it. You can look at it if you like. So, so, so but if you have them spin anti-parallel and only if they're precisely anti-parallel, then the electric field adds, but the magnetic field cancels. So E cross B goes to zero. You end up with something which is pretty much stationary or static, but it, and it's just electric field. So it has twice the electron charge, but it has a topology which is anti-rotating in momentum space. You have spin one direction and spin the opposite direction, but they're not spins in space. They're spins in this internal space. The spins in tri-vector space, the spins are in tri-vector space, obviously, but tri-vector space isn't a tri-vector in space. It is a tri-vector of space and time. So and this is why spin is so weird, because it's an internal property. It's like if you take the thing going around, imagine it going around a torus in momentum space, then uh, what it's like is it's like going around the torus left-handed. So if you look, take a slice of the sausage of the torus, an electron could go around right-handed or left-handed. Well, in a, in a boson, one of them's right, the other one's the other way around. So, 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 so it's really a counter-rotating in momentum space, in an inner space, where the spins cancel in that inner space. Now that is topologically an extremely solid object. If you look at, that's a dielectron. That's an electron, it is no longer, anal it's not two electrons, they're superimposed on one another, and they're interacting with one another in an absolutely fundamental way where most of the magnetic field has canceled in order to maintain the mass. So you end up with something which is topologically very different, a dielectron, and that dielectron is in superconductivity the thing responsible for the superconducting state. It's the, it's the Cooper pair. Cooper pair is not a couple pair of things in energy. You know that it's not because of the Tate anomaly, the Tate effect. You measure the mass of the Cooper pair. It's not bound. It's unbound. It's more massive than two electrons in a superconductor in, in niobium. Look it up. Look at Tate anomaly. I'll put it up on... Okay, John. Um, Look at experiment. Yeah, I, I was... We are formulated a question. I forgot about your hedgehog. Uh, yeah, I forgot about the hedgehog thing. Yeah, yeah, good. Um, now, okay, we, we've got this double loop. That means the electron is more like a disk than a sphere, the single no. electron? No, absolutely not. The double loop is in momentum space. So, so, so it's looping in K space. So, so if, if you're in the solid state, you have a couple of things. The, um, the band structure is in K space. It's in momentum space. It, it's not going, it's not a little donut. It's not going around, around some, what I said before, it's not in space, it's of space. So the thing is spherical in space. If, you, if you, It has to be spherical in space because there's only one object. So by symmetry, it has to be spherical. So, so what's happening is in, in it, if you look at a photon, right? So look at photon diagram, you, you draw the photon as being something which goes loopity loopity loop along some path. But that's bullshit as well because there is no path because photons construct things to zero. You've only got the rotation and, and, and a certain number of oscillations. So, so when you're right, you're drawing that in momentum space as well, but you think about it in real space, and of course you can put it in a box and measure the, measure, measure the mode structure in real space. You can do that if you've trapped it and made it go backwards, forwards and form a, a resonance. But if it's just traveling by itself, it's in momentum space. So no, it's not a donut. It's not like a disc. 
it never was like a disc. Even in the original paper in 97, when Martin and I were, were just starting on this sort of thing, we did qualify the thing very strongly, although we didn't understand enough about the nature, but well, we didn't have the Clifford algebra at all at that stage. That was Phil Butler. Thank you, Phil, if you ever listen to this, okay. teaching us the Clifford algebra back in, uh, when was that? About 90, 96, I think, he taught us the Clifford algebra. We formulated theory before that. But it's, no, it's not a little disc, it is spherically symmetric. Briefly, yeah. Thanks. Hey folks, I think we're gonna to have to stop because I'm being dragged away. Um, but John, thank you ever so much. I mean, the, the amazing thing really is we're getting all this stuff on video and you're getting all your stuff in Cusicle on video. Yeah. And this is, this is brilliant. Before everybody goes, there's going to be a bunch of invitations coming out shortly to join us on Quisicle. I've, I've paused things at the moment because there's just so much going on at Ampa. But um, some of us are having trouble because you're holding this at 5 p.m. UK time, which is bad timing for our American friends because it's the middle of a working day. So yes. several, several are saying they can't, they're having to look at this thing. So, but you can't help the planets around. So somebody's always going to be, uh, have difficulties with this. But it's all going down to video. As you say, that is fantastic. But... Re really, yeah. I mean, the Quisicle thing that we, we set up there was also based on really a set of relationships developed in AMPA. So there's going to be, a, I'm going to be sending out invitations to people once we finish the AMPA thing to come and join us on Quisicle as well. And we, what we've been doing is we've been doing a talk every Sunday at 5 p.m. So also, but at least the Americans are not normally working on Sundays. So, so, um, so, um, <laughs> so it's a little bit better. 2 a.m. in the morning before yeah. I'll on the east coast of, uh, of Australia. So uh, he's getting everything on video. Anyway, yeah, it's a pleasure, everybody. Uh, but you're right, it's time to stop. But it's, it's, yeah, but, but thank you ever so much. Um, okay, tomorrow I want to do something a bit different. Um, please bring something to make a noise with. Okay. That's all I want to say. All right, bring something to make a noise with. Okay. And I'll see you tomorrow. You Take care. Okay. Cheers. All right, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.